So this was a bit of offcut MDF I used to increase the thickness of the template that I would use to route the neck pocket. As you saw, I did exact the shape of the neck on the original route template. Because my flush trim bit is 25mm and the neck pocket was not going to be so deep, I had to raise the template height for clearance. This thicker MDF and the original route template combined gave me the distance I needed to be precise with my router depth. I decided not to add an angle to the neck, or what you would call break the neck, as they do on a Gibson Les Paul guitar. So I had to raise the neck by making the route less deep and come up to meet the strings. The problem is that the Gibson Les Paul style bridge is a lot higher than a Fender Stratocaster bridge, and therefore I needed to make up the difference, otherwise there would be too much distance between the strings and the fretboard. I should add an image to demonstrate the difference. You should be seeing that right now. Here I am cutting out the outlines of the pickup routes to trace the shapes onto the body as a visual guide. I used the router freehand to route the pickup cavities and just use the template to stay true to the center line when marking the outlines on the body. Here I am lining up the neck router template to the copy of the thicker MDF. I was also preparing some nails to secure the location. To make the transfer, I am using the smaller flush trim router bit that I have. Because I was forced to buy these router bits through eBay, I bought them from China and only paid around $5 each.
I didn't bother filing back the inside corners of the neck route on the thicker MDF to the actual shape of the guitar neck. This was because the trim bit radius was 12mm and it would not fit into the corners anyway. To calculate how deep to route the neck pocket, here I am taking measurements. This is based on how thick the neck is, minus how low the bridge can go, plus how far the strings need to be from the frets on the neck. The number I came up with was 13.5mm, or 0.527 of an inch. The only way to lower the bridge is to route a ditch in the front of the body, and I didn't want to do that. So as I route away the neck pocket, I am only taking away 4mm of depth at a time. I was only roughing out the bulk of the material inside the lines of the template, because at this shallow, the bearing had nothing to ride along, and if the bit touched the sides of the template, the shape would have changed and the template would be useless. In my mind, it's like digging a swimming pool. As you are creeping up on the final shape of the sides, and only when deep enough, I would run the bearing to the wall to give it the final shape. This would be another run, taking only another 4 to 5 millimeters of depth away, and the bearing is still riding higher than the template. As I went along, I already had my stop depth set on the router, so I would not risk overshooting the depth that I had to cut out. This was the last pass before the bearing would be low enough to ride along the edge of the template. Now is the final cut where I am at depth and running the bearing of the bit on the template.
Somehow I missed a spot when running the trim bit along the bearing and I realigned the template for whatever reason. I did not use the same nail holes as before, lining it up again by a feel, and this made the next socket a fraction wider than it needed to be. On the real build, I added some masking tape to the inside of the template to make the pocket even tighter, as a counter to what happened here. So with such a thick body and a shallow neck, there is less of the neck screws entering the neck, but until now I have not had any problems. I believe they go at least 14 millimeters into the neck to hold it in place. As I already mentioned, the router bit radius was too large to reach the corners of the neck template. So here I am chiseling out the corners of the neck pocket to allow the neck all the way into its final position. I wasn't too worried about making a clean cut here because the pick guard would cover up any excess gap that I might create by overdoing it this way. I sanded back as much of the excess wood filler as I could because I was about to run the router with the round over bit around the back for the first time. I didn't want the rough wood filler to affect the flow of the router as I went around. The two pieces of pine you see under the body are actually from the first attempt to liquid nail two pieces side by side as a part of the body blank creation. The reason why I rejected these two pieces is because when I glued them together I did not clamp them vertically as well as horizontally so it bowed up and it could not be used. I then snapped the joint in half to see how well the liquid nails was holding. It was pretty convincing, but being the strong man that I am, I could break it apart with my bare hands. For safety, I should have weighted that plastic that is flapping around behind the router there. It would not have been a personal safety issue, but it could have been sucked up into the router bit and caused some damage to the job, the router, and possibly my ego.
The round over bit I chose to use is a 12mm radius because I believe that this is the radius used on Stratocasters. But the Mexi Strat that I have is not as rounded over as this. The Squire body on the Sunburst project I have is more rounded over than this. So I don't know what goes on in the Squire and Fender factories for there to be such a difference. I was aiming for the strut roundover, but in the end it's all a matter of taste. Being that the Maiden Flamingo is more curvy, the 12mm roundover feels more suited to the area that it was from. So on a roundover bit, the guide bearing is at the bottom of the bit, so just running it around the edge of the guitar will guide its way. The height of the bit would be an issue if it is not set within a fine variance. Too high is not a real problem, but too low would gouge an additional line 12mm into the face of the guitar. Here I am setting up to drill my first ever bridge socket. As a way of controlling where the 11mm drill bit goes, I used a piece of MDF with a pre-drilled hole and used crosshairs on it to line up with the markings where I wanted the centre of the sockets. When you see the drill jam, it's because I'm using the drill on the lowest speed possible so I can maintain a degree of control. A drill press would have been ideal for this, but this is the DI guy wire talking here. Why would this guy have one of those?
being aware that the holes only need to be so deep and to not be at risk of going through the body, I have marked off the required depth with some tape. I was just rocking the drill back and forth to try making the hole a bit larger. It might not have helped and can probably increase the risk of chip out on any other type of wood, but this pine wood seemed almost resilient to large chip out. I didn't do this on the real body I made out of Queensland maple because it was a lot harder and the risk of chip out would have been a lot higher. Considering this was a cheap bridge, and I have little faith in the strength of the materials, I thought it might crack if the hole was too tight. If I did this again, I would leave it as the size of the drill bit, but use a sandpaper drum to make any enlargements. Here is my latest invention. It's a hand wound sander. I have taped the rolled up sandpaper to a hand wound drill that I picked up for drilling pick guard screw holes with care. As time went on, I found the best way to remove the bridge mounts was by using a claw hammer and pulling up on the loosened bridge pole. This can be done with care and with a piece of scrap wood to protect the body from the pressure of the hammer. This point is where I started lining up the second bridge socket location. I don't have a center punch, which would have made this a lot easier to make the mark I needed. I used the drill hole template again, so as I drilled, it would not deviate from the target location. I made an improvement to the modified beta drill to sand out the hole and make it a tiny bit larger so there is not much force required to insert the bridge sockets. What I like to do is run the drill backwards first before going forwards to create a bit of a pit to keep the drill centered using its own mark. Again, where you see the drill jamming, that is because I like to start on the lowest power setting 
probably being a little bit overcautious. The drill on a higher setting may have cut through just nicely, but I did not want it to overpower when it grabs and tear through the body. I don't use large drill bits too often, so I was unsure of how it would behave. The bridge sockets overhang the hole a bit, so this burr on the edge of the hole was nothing to worry about. I realised that there was a tiny alignment issue, but I found that these screw-in poles have a little bit of play in them if they are screwed in all the way and then loosened off just a fraction. I was very happy about this outcome being the first time that I had done this. I feel that I got lucky in many ways for it to turn out this well.
I was a little bit too worried about getting the socket stuck in the guitar, and by drilling holes in the back, thought I could poke them back out from the other side if I needed to. In the end, this was a stupid idea. As I mentioned just before, at the same time, I figured out how to remove them using the screw-in poles and a claw hammer. I was still trying to angle the socket holes because of the slight difference. In the end, I ended up making the sockets larger than they needed to be, and I can now almost pull out the big sockets by hand. Not to worry, because the tension of the strings hold them down, and there is no risk of them falling out at all. You can see that I was trying everything that I can here to get a little play and correcting the alignment of the big poles. I completely forgot to turn on the camera when I installed the next two holes for the string tail piece, but as you can see it went well. Here is the first test to see if the neck and bridge are aligned both centrally and that the strings are not too high off the frets. That's the end of part two. I'll see you again in part three.